name is Renato Martins. I'm the uh, uh, Steve Petersdorf uh, Chair in Cancer Care at the University of Washington. And um, we um, have a program uh, for you tonight, which is centered obviously around lung cancer, uh, as well as the impacts of COVID-19 uh, to lung cancer patients and their uh, treatment. This webcast is presented by Cure and sponsored by AstraZeneca and the Go02 Foundation, which by the way is a very clever name uh, for lung cancer. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that in a minute. I was tasked to give you some housekeeping uh, notes, which I'm uh, reading from my cheat sheet here. And um, you're going to be receiving a survey by the email that you register um, tomorrow. And um, thank you for watching the full webinar and completing the survey. And then you enter to win a $200 uh, Visa gift card. This is supposed to be interactive. So we really hope that you will be using the uh, chat box. Uh, when that time comes and uh, uh, we can um, uh, answer your questions and make this as lively as possible. Um, there is a help uh, widget uh, in the uh, uh, dock button there. And if you run into trouble with sound and video, um, use that so we can see if we can help from here. Uh, we have two presenters today, one uh, obviously me, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Millie Das, who is the clinical associate professor at Stanford University and chief of oncology at the VA uh, Palo Alto Healthcare System, uh, which is probably the best located VA in the entire planet Earth. Um, and Dr. Amy Moore, who is the director of science research for the Go To Foundation for Lung Cancer. And before we uh, go too far, Amy, would you um, um, mind telling us a little bit about the uh, Go To Foundation and what uh, you guys do and the important work in lung cancer research and advocacy as well? Sure, happy to, and thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. You know, um, I'm just thrilled to be able to share a little bit of our collective knowledge to help educate and empower the lung cancer community. Go to just celebrated our one year anniversary. We were launched in April of 2019 through the merger of what was formerly known as the Bonnie J. Adario Lung Cancer Foundation based out here in the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as the Lung Cancer Alliance in Washington, D.C. And through that merger, we bring, you know, collective strengths and complementary assets to the table to continue to educate and empower the community we serve. You know, we're very much about um, providing the necessary educational resources to support our patients in their treatment um, to help them navigate that pathway. Obviously, we have a strong program focused on science and research in partnership with our sister organization, the Adario Lung Cancer Medical Institute. And then we also have several national networks of centers of excellence, one of which our screening centers of excellence is focused on best practices around low-dose CT screening. And then our care continuum centers of excellence, which is focused on delivery of quality lung cancer care in the community setting. We also have a lung cancer registry where we follow patients uh, longitudinally to uh, assess different aspects of their uh, disease and treatment, and as well as quality of life metrics. We have a lung match program, which provides really personalized clinical trials navigation with a team of masters and PhD level scientists so that we can make patients available of or make patients aware of the clinical trials that are available to them so they are empowered to have those conversations with their treatment team. And we do all of this in service of lung cancer patients and work closely with a number of patient organizations and patient groups to do that work. So, you know, and um, we're growing every day and adding new um, components and are in the midst of our strategic plan. So we're very focused on early detection, comprehensive biomarker testing, some of which we might touch on later tonight. That's, uh, that's fantastic, such a, such a important work, really. So we're gonna get into the program and the things that we uh, prepared. We actually got together in a uh, conference call um, ahead of this uh, meeting. 
to try to make this as valuable to all of you. And I think that we, what we had planned is to start to talk a little bit about the impact that we have seen in our practices from COVID-19 and the impact in lung cancer. So, Millie, do you want to um, get us started on that discussion? And uh, we'll all chime in uh, in sequence here. Sure. Thanks, Renato. It's really great to be here. Um, you know, I think, of course, when the pandemic started in, in March, it really uh, forced us to to think about how we were going to move forward in, in, in our practice and in seeing patients. And um, one of the uh, big things that came out of this has been telemedicine, um, really um, trying to uh, minimize uh, patients coming into the clinics and, um, you know, potentially being exposed. And um, and so overnight, we were all kind of thrown into learning telemedicine. Um, I had done it many years ago, um, but it wasn't something that, you know, I had a lot of familiarity with. And I, I think, you know, providers across the board were, were learning um, as we went along. And, um, and so I thought that, uh, you know, that has really been great in, in some ways, but you know I think one of the big challenges with with telemedicine for me personally has just been um, particularly with new patients. I think when we um, are seeing our new patients, you, you know we have a, a, a protocol by which we you know we see patients in, in our clinics, and we um, can really have you know long detailed conversations where we can explain things on on paper or perhaps have other people come in and, and join us um, during the meetings. And I think that's one of the things that um, has been I think difficult in, in um, with using telemedicine. Um, and I've certainly struggled with that. I think for the existing patients, for patients that you know, I've known for for some time, I think. You know, it was it was pretty seamless, and and um, I think the patients uh, really appreciated that. But I do think that it, you know, it's it wasn't it, it maybe doesn't work for every every patient, um, and so you know, certainly within my two practices at Stanford and at the uh, VA in Palo Alto, um, you know, we were pretty we were trying to be accommodating to really the patients' needs. So you know, there were certain patients who really insisted on coming in in person if they were going to be coming in any way for a blood draw or a scan, they really preferred to, to be seen in person. And of course, we had a lot of the safety precautions in place, um, you know, even at the start of the pandemic. And of course, the, you know, it's been evolving. And so um, I think, uh, you know, our practices have definitely changed. We've, we've definitely um, brought in some telemedicine, but we do also see a lot of our patients still in, in person. Um, and, um, and we're all, you know, sort of learning about this together as, as we move forward. Yeah, that's that's such an uh, a key issue. You know, I I have an administrative position at the SCCA, and when we talk about electronic medical records, I always say that I never met anyone that got into medicine because they loved interacting with computers. And, right. and likewise, I think what differentiates a a great physician is the, the love of people, is is that personal interaction, and. Uh, uh, sometimes, if you already have a relationship with the patient, telemedicine works great. Uh, if you don't, then it becomes um, much more impersonal. So I, I struggle with that too. Um, mm -hmm. Amy, what, what have you seen from from an advocacy standpoint and the anxiety of patients um, feeling that they have a very serious medical problem and, and then at the same time, it looks like the medical community has come to a halt uh, mm -hmm. with COVID-19. Right. Yeah, I think there are some real concerns among the lung cancer community. You know, in the early days of the pandemic, there were concerns that patients would simply be triaged out of treatment, that late stage lung cancer patients in particular might not get access to ventilators, for example. And, you know, then we saw increasing fears that, um, you know, clinical trials were shutting down or that research was shutting down. And, you know, those are, I think, all obviously real concerns. And as an advocacy group, you know, we immediately recognized the the risk that COVID presents to the lung cancer community. It is a, a very real threat and patients do have heightened risk for severe disease and increased mortality. Um, and we're seeing those reports come out, you know, now through several registry studies, for example, and there was even some data that came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering looking at a small cohort, about 100 lung cancer patients with COVID. And, and again, we're seeing kind of this um, 
these increased rates of hospitalization and increased mortality. So, you know, we kind of um, rapidly mobilized at GoTo, uh, both doing some um, things internally as well as coordinating with other advocacy groups. So at GoTo, you know, we have done many things. For example, one of our cornerstone or flagship programs is something we call the living room where, you know, monthly we normally have um, a support group for patients where we bring in experts on different topics, but we created something called the rapid response living room where we were doing these weekly um, in the height of the pandemic to really address topics that were, um, you know, that we felt the community needed to hear. And then across the advocacy groups, we've been kind of combining our voices to vet the onslaught of information that's coming out because i mean as scientists and as physicians you know it's hard for us to keep up with all the information let alone for patients so we want to you know provide that vetted information and um, provide a unified voice to the community again around this um, you know, effort to educate and empower patients so they can take the necessary precautions and make the decisions that are best for them and their family in consultation with, you know, their treatment team. So I think the fears are real, but the takeaway is that, you know, clinical trials have not stopped. Research has not stopped. We've had to find new ways to adapt in the face of some of the challenges and obstacles that COVID has presented. But, you know, we're going to, I think, get into a deeper discussion. We've seen some recent rapid progress, multiple new drug approvals, for example. So, you know, we want to assure the community that there's still a lot of hope and that progress continues to be made. Um, so, it maybe looks different than what we envisioned, but we're still working and we're still making progress. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, Millie, we, we talked a little bit about when we prepare for this, about what you saw as the progression of research opening up again at Stanford. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think it would be informative to people to, to learn a little bit how thoughtful that process is. It seems that it was pretty similar to what we did here. So why don't you uh, give people a little bit of a flavor of, uh, of what has happened in terms of the research, the research at Stanford? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's important to know that research really never stopped. So um, patients who are on interventional trials continued on their trials really without pause. Um, again, as Amy alluded to, we had to make some, we had to adapt. Um, and so uh, study coordinators were um, maybe not as available in person. And so um, some of uh, the, the work that they would have done fell onto the um, co-investigators or the principal investigator for the trial. Um, but those trials went on and patients continued to come in for their visits and receive their treatments. Non-interventional trials were paused um, for some time during um, COVID, although I would say, you know, starting in the month of June, um, that research has also, you know, resumed in, in sort of a phased approach at Stanford. And, um, and so I think that there, you know, there, there's been really continued enthusiasm for research. Um, and, um, you know, now there, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies had sort of paused new trials for a month or two during the pandemic. But again, that, that you know, that pause has, has really stopped, I would say, you know, at the beginning of June. And, um, you know, we're now, you know, really kind of open for business. Um, for patient blood and tissue samples um, that we were collecting uh, at Stanford, at least, we're, you know, we are um, requiring or at least highly recommending that they get tested for COVID um, prior to, you know, getting processed um, through, uh, you know, certain laboratories. And so there are precautions and um, other steps that have been put into place um, with the resumption of, of research activities. Yeah, at the, at the University of Washington and the Fred Hutch, we uh, really paused the accrual of trials that had a uh, reasonable chance of requiring an admission. Um, and, and I think that the, the justification for that was that uh, um, we had no idea if we were going to be overrun uh, like they were in New York City. As it turns out, you know, we're part of uh, a international registry of lung cancer um, patients um, with COVID. And uh, I would say, fortunately, our contribution to that register so far has been zero because we really have not had a single patient with lung cancer that has developed COVID. 
And although we do have a very busy, the largest cancer center in the Pacific Northwest, uh, in our main campus, we only had 48 patients with, uh, with COVID, uh, which is much, much better than we predicted with everything starting here in Seattle. Um, so I think that we, we touched a little bit about uh, the approvals uh, that we've seen. And, and I think that uh, from a patient perspective, this is really a quite fascinating time uh, because the, it almost like feels that the FDA has gone on a binge of, uh, <laughs> of approvals in, in lung cancer. You know, I think that from the top of my head, we had two approvals in the immunotherapy arena, two approvals in the target therapy arena, and most recently an approval for small cell lung cancer, actually three approvals for uh, target therapy arena. And uh, if you count the um, uh, erlotinib and the VGF inhibitor combination uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it is amazing. Uh, how much we've made progress in expanding progressively the number of uh, specific subgroups of lung cancer patients that can have really pretty substantial benefits for the therapy of the lung cancer they have. You know, I, I tell my patients that, you know, when, when someone out in the community, another physician calls me for some advice regarding how to treat a lung cancer patient. And I almost take a nap un until they tell me what kind of lung cancer it is, because the initial description of, you know, I have a patient with lung cancer, and I'm like, you know, I don't know what that means. Uh, you know, you have to tell me more. You know, there is, that disease doesn't exist anymore, lung cancer. You know, there is the lung cancer with this alteration, with that alteration that is likely to respond to immunotherapy and so far and so on. So I think that, that that should give a lot of hope to patients that, that science keeps moving forward and more options of treatment are coming. You know, we saw it last ASCO, what we have all been hoping for, which is these advances in the advanced setting moving into earlier stages of disease and hopefully leading to a cure uh, uh, you know, after they've shown that they can prolong life with quality, that they can actually cure patients in the more um, early stages of, of disease. You know, uh, one, one thing that, uh, that we have an advantage here is that you know, Amy has a, a uh, her previous life was dedicated to the understanding of uh, viruses. I uh, was wondering if you could tell us a little bit of what your expert prediction is of how long <laughs> COVID is going to be around. And are we going to have a vaccine that looks like polio, where you, know, you take it and that's it, it's eradicated? Or this is going to be a little bit more like the flu where you have to keep adapting the vaccine over time and it's partially protective. And if you've been vaccinated and you got the disease, you have a less aggressive form of the disease. In which of these two extremes do you think that, uh, that a possible <laughs> vaccine will uh, he's, he's throwing me under the bus here. No, um, you know, obviously these these are the million dollar questions, and if I had the answer to all those questions, then you know we would have solved this a long time ago. I think there are a lot of efforts underway to to understand what we're up against, and you know, from a vaccine perspective, you know, there are at least eighty, if not more, now um, vaccine efforts that are solid, solidly underway with several leading candidates that are moving forward. Um, you know, there was a lot of buzz around um, Moderna's vaccine, for example, um, and there are several others that are entering clinical trials. You know, what it looks like for some of these candidates is, you know, often when we think about vaccinations, kind of to your polio reference, we think, you know, you get a shot and, and you're taken care of, you know, you never have to think about it again. That's not necessarily what we're talking about here. We're not yet to the point where we have a preventive vaccine. I think the ones that are currently being tested 
would really prevent more severe manifestations of the disease. You know, what the data from Moderna's vaccine showed is that there are, um, at higher doses, there's some reactivity. So there are some concerns there. And so if you administered lower doses, you might require you know, multiple rounds, you know, you might require what we call a prime. So the initial vaccination and then boost sometime later, you know, there's a lot of work underway to obviously understand, you know, if people are immune, what does, you know, do people generate antibodies against this virus? Are those antibodies protective for how long are they protective based on previous um, coronaviruses? So SARS-CoV-2 is the seventh human coronavirus. There are kind of four that are endemic or naturally circulating, and they don't really cause much problem in humans. Then, you know, in 2003, there was SARS, which kind of exploded, but then kind of fizzled out. So it wasn't um, the threat that we uh, initially feared it might become. Then there was the Middle East, the the MERS virus, um, which again, hasn't been as problematic. The the thing with SARS-CoV-2 is it's kind of I think the perfect storm, if you will, it's something that um, is easily transmissible. Um, it's uh, so it spreads easily. It causes significant disease. So we need to understand um, what the immune response looks like based on those other coronaviruses. We might get some protection on the order of a few months to a couple of years. So I would envision or expect that if you get a vaccine, you might have to get it every so often, kind of like you go annually for your flu shot, you might have to go in every so often for a SARS-CoV-2 shot. You know, what does this mean for the lung cancer community in particular? I think that's what we all want to know. Um, Given that lung cancer patients seem to present, you know, with more severe disease and, and you know, some cases and even have higher mortality. Does that mean they're not generating as robust an immune response, for example? We need to understand these questions so that we can best protect our community and and others who are at elevated risk because of other comorbidities. So there's a lot of work going on to ask all these questions. And, you know, I think what we've learned is since this pandemic has unfolded, our understanding is changing, you know, rapidly, if not almost daily. Um, so what I say today may change tomorrow and it may look completely different in one month and six months from now. Um, so, you know, we're continuing the scientific community, I think, to collaborate um, to, to answer these questions. That, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, Millie, um, you touched a little bit about the issue of, of patients and, and telemedicine. Um, one one thing that uh, that connects with these multiple approvals is the fact that the science in um, lung cancer is changing so fast that even if you are a lung cancer specialist, you really have to be on the lookout to make sure that you are fully updated. I can just imagine how much harder it is if you're trying to see every disease that you know, comes through the door. Um, so how do you see this connection between, I'm sure that there are lots of patients that live around uh, the state of California that will drive one or two hours to get an opinion at, uh, at Stanford. Uh, how do you see the telehealth playing a role in helping those patients and spreading the expertise that you have at Stanford being more readily available throughout the state of California and perhaps even internationally? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, especially during this time when we really shifted even our tumor boards to, to telemedicine and um, and then, of course, our patient visits, I, we, we've been, it's been great to see so many patients um, from, you know, really far away. And, and you know, I think for from the patient perspective, it's, it, you know, they're uh, not having to drive, you know, sometimes two, three, four hours, you know, to, to come in and see us. And um, so that, I think, you know, that's worked out really well. I think from the telemedicine perspective within, uh, for, you know, within uh, Stanford, it, our patients are required to be residing in the state of California. So we, um, we've we been seeing patients up and down the, the California coast um, in, in our telemedicine appointments. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I mentioned, you know, I personally haven't 
loved the the new patient visits over telemedicine though you know i've done several and um and there are uh, you know there are some that that went really well i just i guess i feel that you know had they been in person it could have gone even better um though i understand that of course the the circumstances right now and um and then you know there is just follow-up that we we do with our patients over telemedicine uh, you know maybe instead of giving them a handout in person we're now mailing them things um so you know we're, we're finding workarounds um but we've been really able to reach a, a broad um number of patients and um and i think that we have been you know really seeing the same number of referrals um you know uh, come you know throughout the the epidemic um and you know i think just the the nature of our visits has has, is really the thing that's been impacted the most. Yeah, I, I see the telehealth as a, as a potential opportunity to deliver more broadly, highly specialized care with much less sacrifice to uh, patients. Uh, obviously, understanding what you also mentioned before, which is, you know, some degree of sacrifice to the patient-doctor interaction, which is, you know, obviously so important. Um, I, m my plan was to finish this this discussion between us for the first uh, thirty minutes or so, and then open up for questions. Uh, I'm open to do it differently if you guys would prefer that we intertwine. Well, we actually questions. have some patient questions um, in the chat. Right. So right. yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Let's go ahead and address those. Okay, uh, let's do that then. So um, I would say that, uh, uh, let me preamble by saying that um, I already was looking at some of the questions and some, some to be specific about patient management. And I would say that in a setting like this, one needs to be very careful in not looking like you're making a recommendation about a case you know nothing about. Um, so that's just an introduction. But um, okay, let's, uh, let's tr try to tackle some questions. Um, the, uh, Millie, maybe you can tackle this first one. Um, mm -hmm. If I understand uh, the question here, uh, the issue is uh, target therapies. And um, is it true that, uh, I'm assuming that this is for patients with advanced disease, that, they, that the tumors will always become resistant to them? And then, you know, what, um, what do you do after that uh, once they become resistant to, you know, target therapies? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think you were alluding to a lot of these new, you know, there's recent um, targeted drug approvals. Um, and yes, we generally think about them as not necessarily being cures. We know that a large percentage of patients will respond to these targeted therapies um, with, you know, sort of less side effects than traditional IV cytotoxic chemotherapy, though, though, depending on the drug, there are, you know, some toxicities that can be quite debilitating. So I don't want to necessarily minimize the, the potential for side effects with targeted therapies. Um, but a lot of us have not really been thinking about them as, as cures in the stage four setting, um, because, you know, patients will oftentimes develop resistance. There are some patients um, who are on these targeted therapy drugs for years um, who have not developed resistance. So um, I wouldn't say always, um, you know, or never. Uh, I think that there are always outli outliers. Um, but when we talk to our patients about um, these drugs, of course, it's, I mean, I think it's really encouraging to know when a patient is, um, you know, a candidate for a targeted therapy. And, um, but we, you know, we have to talk about it with a little bit of caution because again, despite the high response rates, you know, some, some of the, the EGFR drugs, 70, 80% response rate, but that also means that 20% of patients don't respond. And so, um, you know, I think it's great if you're one of those responders, um, but there are patients who don't respond and then what do we do? So what do we do in those people who don't respond to targeted therapies and, and or develop resistance at some time point later on down the line? Um, that's a good question. I think, it, again, it depends on the targeted drug. There are, um, 
in, in patients of ALK um, translocations, in patients with ALK translocations, there's data to support the use of other ALK inhibitors after progression on, um, on, an ALK, on a prior ALK inhibitor. Um, so you can consider kind of sequential uh, oral targeted drugs. Um, for EGFR, the, the standard has really become um, osimertinib or Trigriso. And after patients uh, progress on that, we generally would go to IV cytotoxic chemotherapy, uh, plus or minus uh, VEGF inhibitor, plus or minus immunotherapy. Um, and, you know, and I think now we have approvals for, you know, Medexon 14 skipping mutations. Um, the Kepmatinib approval just came weeks ago. Um, so that that's a drug that we're now able to offer our patients. Previously, we may have been treating them with, um, you know, chemotherapy, IV cytotoxic chemo, plus or minus IO, or crizotinib, and now we have another, you know, a, a targeted, oral targeted option. Um, so there is some of the sequencing that we, you know, try to, to try to figure out. I, I think what's also really exciting is when you have a patient that you started on target, when you start, that you start on targeted therapy, and you follow them over a, you know, a course of time, in that span of time, there are new drug approvals that are coming. And so even though you know, in the beginning you may say, well, if this doesn't work, we're gonna go to you know, X treatment, by the time you're faced with that, there may be you know, Y and Z options as well, and you know, that weren't there when the patient started with you. So I, you know, I think that this is, you know, again, very exciting because we're, we're getting a lot of these um, new drug approvals, and we're really trying to hone in on what is the driver mutation for this patient's lung cancer. KRAS is one of the more commonly mutated um, genes in lung cancer, and for many, many years, it's just, you know, eluded sort of targeted drug therapy, and we have some, you know, new data, um, you know, from a drug that's uh, made by Amgen that's showing activity in, the, in these in, in patients with a particular type of a KRAS mutation. So really exciting. I, I don't think that, you know, we anticipated that we would have, you know, availability of those kinds of drugs so, you know, in such a, so, so, so quickly. Um, and it, it's, I feel that, you know, with every passing week, month, um, we're learning more and more about um, other targets in lung cancer. And, and the companies are really working hard to try to develop drugs that are that, that are safe and tolerable and, and effective. I would yes. just add on to that. Sorry to interrupt, Renato, but you know what we advise our patients is at the point of progression. You know the importance of comprehensive biomarker testing to see if new options or additional drugs are available and are an option for you. But then you know we're also seeing how. Um, some of the work we do with the patient groups, for example, I'll just call call out ALK positive as an example. You know, they've partnered with GoTo Foundation. They've partnered with with Longevity to explore options beyond targeted therapy. So with Longevity, they funded some grants to explore, you know, how we can open up immunotherapies to the ALK population, and some of those insights might apply to other mutations as well. On our side, we funded a grant to look at combination therapy. So can we combine different drugs or approaches to delay or ward off resistance? As um, Dr. Trevor Bavona and Dr. Christine Lovely are the PIs of that project, as Dr. Bavona says, you know, we don't want to interrogate the black box after the plane crashes. We want to keep the plane from crashing to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to try to stop that up front. Um, you know, I think that is something that's relatable and understandable for patients. That's what we're trying to do is if we can hit the tumor hard up front, maybe we can prevent the outgrowth of some of those resistant cells. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of research going on across the lung cancer space, exploring how we can open up other treatment options once we maybe have, um, you know, once we've used up all of our targeted options. And we're trying to understand the, the resistance mechanisms. I mean, that's one of the main mm -hmm. uh, things that I think that I, I, I've learned certainly through through the years is, you know, when a patient does progress where we are now doing repeat biopsies to really learn about why why did the cancer progress and is there another targeted option um, that we could, uh, you know, specifically target that resistance pathway that's, that's developed. Um, so, you know, again, I think things are evolving, um, you know, really constantly and, and we're learning, learning more and have more, you know, opportunities to to target these resistance mechanisms as well. Yeah, Amelia, I think that you made such an important point, uh, this idea that uh, um, when we talk about survival, and, and I would say that uh, for patients with advanced disease, in a, even in our group, there is perhaps not complete concordance about what I'm going to say now. But what I tell my patients 
uh, particularly those that have a, a targeted therapy, is that I have no idea what is going to happen. Because if we can't keep your disease under control for one, two, three years with what we have now, which is absolutely conceivable, what will we be offering you two, three years from now? It may be things that are not available today. And in fact, I would venture to say that likely it will be things that are not available today. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's very hard to make predictions based on old data uh, with drugs that are not the same ones we, we use today. I think that's, that's really that's very important to, to keep in mind. Um, yep. Okay, um, so we have a question about... Uh, uh, COVID and its relationship with, with uh, lung cancer. And uh, Amy, do you want to try to tackle that? Is, is lung cancer yeah. a problem or it's the COPD and everything else that lung cancer patients may have? You know, that's a big question right now. I think on the part of patients is, you know, the data that we're seeing that's been put out by the TerraVolt study, this was a, is an international consortium, a registry of lung cancer patients with COVID. Um, you know, they had, uh, I guess, stated that 33% of patients in that study, you know, who, who had COVID um, died from the disease. So we know there seems to be elevated risk, but does that risk hold here in the United States, for example? And so one thing, one caveat is, you know, we're trying to get information out there in the public domain as rapidly as possible so we can um, know and be aware of the potential risk. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that cancer patients are at elevated risk for worse outcomes with COVID. Now we need to understand, does that apply universally across all stages? You know, does it apply for chemotherapy versus immunotherapy versus targeted therapy? And I think, um, you know, I referred to a study that that just came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, where in a relatively small cohort, about 100 patients, you know, they're saying there do appear to be patient-specific parameters that kind of determine ultimate outcomes. So, you know, the thing to recognize is that this is a rapidly evolving situation and the studies that have come out, you know, we have to report what we have with the numbers that we have at the time. So obviously the more patients we study will be able to kind of uh, drill down into, uh, you know, more granularity and more specifics of, you know, the exact details. So um, I would say what we know definitively, uh, and I feel comfortable saying, is that cancer patients are at elevated risk. Does that risk look like 33% that we saw in the TerraVault study? Does it look somewhere less in the U.S.? You know, that's what we're working to define right now. Um, and so I think it's worth acknowledging that there is risk for the lung cancer community. They need to still take precautions until we have a clearer picture. Um, but, you know, it does seem that chemotherapy, uh, patients on chemotherapy maybe have slightly, um, you know, increased risk compared to immunotherapy or targeted therapy. So we're starting to be able to tease apart some of that, but um, there's still a lot of questions that remain. I think it's important to mention from the Sloan Kettering study is that the you know the ma majority of patients, most patients with lung cancer and COVID actually did recover, including right. a significant proportion of patients who were um, intubated. Um, so that mm -hmm. I thought was you know actually quite promising. You know again there are patient specific factors such as COPD, congestive heart failure, just you know advanced age is going to put you at, at at risk. And we of course we know a lot of our lung cancer patients are um, in that you know elderly age bracket. Um, and so th those are sort of risk factors in and of themselves. And then, you know, lung cancer or at really any type of cancer, I think, you know, we are, we're all understanding does put patients at a, um, an elevated risk. But, you know, it doesn't, I think um, the messaging is not that it's a death sentence that, you know, if you get COVID and you have lung cancer, you're not going to make it. I, you know, I, I actually think it's, you know, the, the yep. likelihood is that you will make it. Um, and, you know, and we have, um, you know, we're, we're now, you know, rapidly able to, to diagnose and, and treat patients. Um, and, um, and so I think there's still, there's still a lot of hope. There is hope. I think it's also important that we, you know, of the patients who do recover, what are the long-term implications, you know, of, of that disease having had it? Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what impacts it, the 
infection has on lung function, for example, uh, given that we saw a 20 year old patient who required a double lung transplant. You know, there are obviously these extreme cases. And so we do need clarity on, because we're still just a few months into this pandemic, where the long term, you know, consequences in, and is that immune response um, robust in these patients? And are they now protected if they have been infected and recovered? You know, these are questions that we just don't have answers to yet. But you're right, there is hope, it's not a death sentence. And that is a, a very real, I think, fear, you know, or something that I think we need to acknowledge and be aware of is, you know, this sense of nihilism maybe among patients. And I know in the early days, I saw a patient post online, you know, well, my doctor told me if I, I get COVID, then I'm going to die. Well, that's not actually the case, Perhaps, you know, and we have growing confidence that's not the case, but, um, you know, so we need to be able to uh, give patients the knowledge they need to protect themselves until we have a, a full picture, but there is still hope. Yeah, and Millie, we've talked uh, quite a bit about uh, the doctor patient relationship and the um, psychosocial aspects of caring for lung cancer patients. Uh, recognizing that there is no right or wrong answer here. Um, I suspect that you're facing the same questions that I am in clinic every day, which is the balance between social isolation from fear of COVID versus the social aspects of social isolation. Someone that has advanced cancer and say, you know, I want to be able to see my family and be together with them. Um, so again, recognizing that there is no right or wrong answer here, what, what kind of advice have you been giving to your patients? I mean, I, I think that's been the most heartbreaking part of all this. Um, you know, I think uh, you know, you're dealing with lung cancer. You, you know, you, uh, you've developed, you know, obviously a sense of resiliency and you know, coping mechanisms, and then. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you're not sure whether you can even go outside for your, you know, normal daily walk or whether you can be around your kids and, um, you know, in, safely. And, um, and I, you know, I think um, that's been really hard. I think it's, it's there's definitely been this uh, kind of more of this like mental wellness checking in on, on on the mental wellness of both providers and, and patients frankly i mean we're all um sort of dealing that, with this and um in different ways and i think it's been very very difficult and i found myself really you know first thing now with patients um is really checking in with you know, how how are they doing with everything that's going on in the world you know the pandemic the racial injustice um you know all these um kind of moving parts and then every day we're getting kind of new guidances about what we're allowed to or not allowed to do and i think there's just there's a lot of mixed messaging as well i encourage my patients to continue if they enjoyed going outside for walks to go outside of course maintaining social distance wearing masks um and then, you know, as far as you know, whether it's safe for them to travel, I mean, I, I have a, I've been getting that question a lot from patients. Patients have planned, you know, trips to to take this summer, and is it is it safe for them to go? And um, you know, and I think th those are the hardest questions to answer. I mean, I, you know, and because you want to balance the the, you know, basically providing permission to somebody to to go and live their life and um and and do the things that you know would bring them pleasure but of course there's there's some inherent risks involved right now and um so we, we end up talking about it and 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 really talking about you know what the guidelines are suggesting and um and maybe if you're not going to make that trip to europe this summer then can you substitute that with a, a road trip um or you know something that is maybe uh you know uh, more safe than than air travel right now. So uh, a lot of this kind of negotiation or compromise and um, checking in and, uh, you know, I feel more closely connected to my patients now than I ever have before. I think because we're all, you know, sort of experiencing this this together. I, you know, I have patients oftentimes asking me, you know, how, how are you doing with, you know, having young kids at home and, you know, not them not being able to go to school. And, you know, and I think it's, it's hitting us all in, in different ways. And I think there's a, a sense of a shared humanity. And um, I think that that's one of the main kind of major silver linings that I think has come out of this pandemic. Um, and, and we don't unfortunately have all the answers. I, you know, we're, we're all really trying to figure it out and, and trying to use our best judgment. Um, and, you know, and I, I think it's, it's going, it's going to continue to involve and uh, evolve and, you know, until we have a vaccine, I don't know that we can say that anything is, you know, foolproof or, you know, absolutely safe. 
Yeah, I think that that is such a, a, a great answer. But uh, I, I would say that I'm giving the same advice, outdoors and masked. And yeah. uh, if you are outdoors and masked, uh, then I think it becomes a risk and benefit that it's in favor of doing rather than the uh, other way uh, around. Um, we have a question about telemedicine that I promise we were going to um, tackle next, and, and perhaps all of us should chime into that. Um, I think the question is the impacting of how telemedicine impact the availability of second opinions for lung cancer patients. And, and I think from a foundation standpoint, you're probably hearing a lot about this integration. Uh, we are in the provider side of, of that equation. So why don't you get us started in that discussion, Amy, and then we kind of um, chime in as well. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, we can point to examples of uh, physicians within our network who were already adopters of telemedicine pre-COVID, as you, as you described earlier, uh, Millie, and, and, you know, have comfort doing that and, you know, have been able to do that. I have heard from some of our patients who are on clinical trials, perhaps in, in another state, and, you know, there have been some challenges with um, provider coverage of, of those visits and, and trying to work out the logistics of um, some of those visits across state lines because maybe there are different um, you know rules and, and protocols in place um, but I think you know for the most part we're uh, I think all learning pretty rapidly and, and and we do point to that as one of the um, good things to come out of this pandemic is the, you know, uh, embracing of telemedicine and um, the commitment of, you know, the community physicians and, and the researchers to, you know, making sure that patients are taken care of. So, you know, it's, it's not without its challenges, but it's definitely, I think, something that we've seen a, a rapid uptake on and, and it's helped, you know, make this more manageable for, for all, so. Yeah, what about you, Millie? What, what you have seen in this um, arena of the second opinions? And sounds like in California, you guys, and I will explain that that's not the case here in, in Washington, but sounds like you guys in California are restricted to the state of California, is that correct? That is correct. I think recently uh, we may have been able to start, you know, doing telemedicine visits with patients out of Nevada, but it's a very recent thing. And I, I don't, I, I'm not going to pretend to know all the kind of the background behind that um, and, you know, why that, that, that may be the case. But yeah, we're, we're still doing second opinions just as we were before. And, um, you know, and I think we're, we're all trying to make, um, make sure that we, uh, you know, that we have the, these patients because we're still getting these referrals and, um, you know, and, and I think the thing that really hasn't changed is we, you know, we still, I still talk to a lot of community doctors or doctors in other um, uh, facilities, you know, about mutual patients. I think none of that's really changed for us. Yeah, so uh, we have here in, in, at the University of Washington, we always had uh, something that's called MADCOM, uh, which Every physician uh, in the state of Washington can call doctors from the University of Washington for kind of a curbside about their respective specialties. So we had we had a phone mechanism for it. Um, we can see patients from um, Idaho and Alaska uh, with uh, licensing waivers around COVID. And, and we have a system for very rapid licensing for the state of Montana during this process as well. Um, I would say that one thing that uh, kind of struck me as, as something that uh, advocacy should get more involved is that, you know, I have patients that have uh, traveled to Boston to explore what the options of clinical trials are there or have traveled to Chicago to explore what the options of clinical trials are in Chicago when we don't have a clinical trial open at that time for their specific problem. And if you think about it, that is insane that someone would, would go to that degree of expense because you know we don't allow 
uh, for a isolated consult, a doctor from another state have license uh, that work um, more broadly. Um, you know, that puts such a burden on, on patients that is, in my opinion, totally unjustified. Uh, you know, bring it on, you know, bring, bring the knowledge all around and, and, and make it easier for patients to seek an opinion and be able to explore clinical trials in that setting. Right. And I mean, certainly a large piece of um, go to and the strength of the merger with what was the Lung Cancer Alliance based in D.C. is our whole policy team that works on you know issues like this. But again, I would point to go to's lung match program where patients, you know, can call in from wherever they are. And we have a expert team ready to help them navigate to clinical trials where they are, um, you know, and we do a lot of work in the community setting to bring, you know, high level uh, cancer care to patients in their local community. So, you know, we are tackling this at, at different levels and, and via different mechanisms. Um, but I agree with what you're saying. I think, you know, there is, to your point, great variability depending on the state, you know, where the physician is and, and the rules within that state. So it would be awesome, you know, if, if doctors were just uh, licensed, you know, for all the U.S., but, um, you know, that's um, a larger conversation for sure. Right. I mean, and I think that there are licenses and licenses, right? I mean, you, you may not be licensed to go in an intensive care unit in Idaho and take care of a patient. But that's different than giving a second opinion in your area of specialty via telemedicine. So, you know, so mm -hmm. that's a much more narrow uh, practice of medicine. Uh, um, so anyway, um, we are coming to a close here. There is one, one question about uh, mental health and, uh, and what are the critical psychological needs that we see uh, at this time? Um, I, I think that really described so eloquently this issue of feeling more connected with your patients. It is so, so heartwarming when um, you ask a patient, how is he or she doing? And because of all of this, they turn to you and say, what about you? How are you doing? Mm -hmm. and, and I go like, oh, I'm doing just fine. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's so great. Um, so yes, that connection has increased, but I think that over time, one thing that, uh, that I see patients struggling more and more, and in fact, I had that happen with me today, is something that we talked earlier about the uncertainty of prognosis. You know, in the past, it was much more like you had lung cancer, all diseases were the same, we gave you chemotherapy, we had one line of treatment, if that didn't work, then that's, that's the end of the treatments that we had to offer. And now it's like, you know, I don't know. Will you live two years with this? Four, eight? Will there be another drug in four years and then that will extend things for even longer? You know, how do I plan my life? And, and I had bilateral pulmonary embolisms after uh, <laughs> a flu three years ago and almost died. And, and one thing that, that I definitely took from that experience is that you have no control over the future. And, and you know, if things are going well now, then you enjoy now. And six months from now, I guess, we'll figure it out. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm trying to equate what I had with having an advanced malignancy that you're fighting every day. That's not the point. The point is that we think we control things when, in fact, we do not. Um, so, what, what about uh, what about the two of you? What what psychological needs have have you seen uh, that seem to be more uh, in the forefront? Um, Amy, do you want to? get this started, what you hear from. Sure. I mean, you know, going back to the work that the advocacy groups are doing jointly to provide these uh, weekly and now biweekly updates on COVID to the lung cancer community. As part of that, we've been 
trying to get a handle on, you know, what are the most pressing patient concerns. And I think, you know, everything you described is just compounded by the pandemic, right? I mean, we all feel the anxiety and the uncertainty of what's to come. And, you know, for, for cancer patients in particular, you know, having that access to treatment, you know, access to clinical trials, the impacts on research, um, what it what it means for for them on an individual level, and I do think those mental health aspects are critically important. You know that we address some of some of these fears and anxieties, and like you said, you know we have to balance protecting our patients with also supporting their you know other needs and and that sense of connection. And so at the end of the day, we have to. I think educate and empower them to to address the whole person. But um, yeah, I think those are the things we've seen most from the work that we've been doing on these updates. Is just wanting to know what does it mean in terms of my treatment. You know, what about clinical trials? What about research? But you know, this was more on the psychological pieces. So I would say that you know that sense of isolation I think is is of concern to me um, looking at this. Okay, what about you? What, what have you seen the patients most most uh, agonize about it? I think um, you know there. I've seen a little bit of an uptick in you know, just the general sense of anxiety, um, which is really I think common amongst really everyone. It's not just specific to, to lung cancer patients. Uh, what's been really great is that you know we have psychologists who are now also really adept at telemedicine. I'll, you know I have a, a number of patients that I you know refer um, and to get basically therapy over telemedicine, and that's really worked really well. We have a lot of patients that we co-manage with our palliative care teams to really optimize symptom management and. Again, that's been working really well over telemedicine. And so getting other specialists um, to, to join you in the telemedicine efforts and, um, you know, really with that focus on, on mental health, um, I think has has actually worked pr you know, pretty well. I was a little bit skeptical um, because I, you know, I feel like there is something lost that I mentioned kind of at the beginning of this, you know, without having the, the patient sitting, you know, right there by you. But I, you know, I, I do in, in the patients that I've referred and, and who've been receiving these services over telemedicine, I've, I've really mostly just heard positive feedback from them and, and it's really worked well for them. In fact, it's allowed more flexibility. They're able, you know, they're sitting in their living room or they have their loved ones with them, you know, during the session and, and maybe they wouldn't have been available because it would have been at work or, you know, and so, um, so again, kind of positive things that have come out of this. And, um, and, and I think there's just, again, the sense that we're all, you know, there to sort of help each other. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think we touched on this, as much earlier, but I, you know, for patients who are really worried about whether they had COVID or have COVID or, you know, there's now, I think, widespread testing occurring, you know, across the, the nation. And especially because of the, the symptom overlap between lung cancer and COVID, I'm finding that a lot of my patients are getting tested just because they have, you know, symptoms that, you know, are, we know that is most likely related to their lung cancer, but, you know, when they're getting screened, you know, at the time of their appointment or, you know, before getting a biopsy or before getting pulmonary function tests, they, you know, they, they're required to undergo the COVID testing. And so, you know, I think that that's providing some reassurance to patients too, is, um, you know, knowing that they, they test negative. And of course it doesn't, you know, it means that they need to continue to, to observe all the, the usual precautions. Um, but, I, you know, I think I encourage patients to get tested if that's something that they're really worried about. Mm -hmm. So, um, Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, it's eight o'clock now. I, I hope that uh, all of you uh, listening to us um, have enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, this was a terrific experience. Uh, I, I greatly enjoy working with Amy and Millie in preparation uh, for this. And, and it was a total joy to doing uh, with them as well. Um, so um, to conclude, I want to say that, uh, you know, remember that you're going to be getting your uh, email uh, and please respond to that. Uh, maybe you will get the Visa gift card. Uh, so that will be an added bonus. Um, I want to thank my co-panelists, uh, Amy and Millie, for uh, helping put this together and, and really giving great answers today. 
Uh, I'd like to thank Cure and our sponsors, AstraZeneca and Ingo2 Foundation, for making this uh, educational webcast possible. And uh, um, I think we're going to close for now. Uh, I wish everyone a, a great rest of the night and uh, uh, goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.